kind of miss those days. But I can go back 20 years. 20 years ago, I pastored this little church in Springfield, Kentucky. I think that's where Pastor Fred is right now. He's in Kentucky. A little water thing, a little, are you saying I'm a little, little guy? I have like a kid's table I can sit at too. Man, I tell you, in my family growing up, your goal was to sit at the adult table at Thanksgiving. But you had to wait for somebody to die. So it was like a horrible thing. You know, somebody would die, and then somebody would get to move up into the ranks. It was kind of a morbid thing. I, the card table in the kitchen, but I'll tell you about that another day. 20 years ago, I pastored this little church in Springfield, Kentucky. Springfield, Kentucky is in the middle of nowhere. It's an Amish community. And I, I remember when I first moved in there, I didn't know what Amish were. Amish, if you say that right. And there's this little horse and buggy going through town, you know. So I run up, and I stop the guy. And I was a little taken back because he looked like Abraham Lincoln. He had this big beard and a hat. And I thought, he's like a tour guide. I said, hey, man, how much is it for you to give me a tour of this town? And, and he says, young man, we're Amish. Amish. We don't do tours. And he just kept on going. And I thought, well, there you go. Springfield, Kentucky. But this little church had the same 44 people in it every single Sunday. Um, when you're a student pastor, they send you to the older churches. That's just what happens to you. So I'm 25 years old. This little church is the same 44 people, tiny little place. It was right, the parsonage was literally 10 feet away. The parsonage is the house you live in when you're pastoring there, you know? So you had the parsonage, you had the church. And right next to the church was the Baptist parsonage. And the Baptists had the biggest church in town. And their house was bigger than our church. So we're talking small, right? So we're landlocked. And these folks are really sweet, and here I am, 25 years old, dreaming, you know, I'm ready to go out there and conquer the world, and they're looking at me like, yeah, okay, just hang on, kid, we'll teach you a few things. And they did. They told me about their past. They told me about the ice cream social they did, and how there used to be so many people, and they would tell me how great it was when Pastor so-and-so was here, and all their kids were young, and, and everybody moved away, and they, they were just kind of hanging on to their past. Have you ever met someone like that? Like, every time you talk to them, it's like going to Cracker Barrel. They're always nostalgic. There's never anything current. There's always something behind. And I remember as a young pastor, I was so frustrated by that. Like, I wanted to do things. I was so held back, and, and, and I was getting bored, and I was getting frustrated with God. My like, God, ministry's got to be more than this. How come I can't grow a church? And I couldn't. I had nothing I could do. Sweet people, I had nothing I could do with grow that church. So finally, God one day spoke to me. I finally prayed about it. And he said, they need hope. And I'm like, what in the world's hope? And I started doing something very simple. I started pressure washing their sidewalk, planting flowers, started cleaning up the mold off the side of the building, started cleaning the stained glass. And I remember they would drive up and they say, Pastor, why are you doing this? And I said, well, I love you guys. Y'all been loving me. I just want to do something nice. Well, before you knew it, they started joining me, painting, doing new wallpaper, updating. And then momentum started building. They built this wheelchair ramp, and then they, they padded all the pews because they were very uncomfortable pews. They weren't chairs like this. And they started going crazy. You know, we had this big pipe organ in there that hadn't worked for 130 years. They, they finally removed it so I could actually have a, a place to preach from instead of this big organ right here always behind me. And we had some momentum. So one day God told me, he said, it's time. So we sat in our little, our little fellowship hall in the basement. And we're sitting there. And they had this uh, chalkboard, and I said, y'all, let's dream about the future. And they laughed, but we had some momentum. Uh, they, uh, so a few new visitors were coming in, and they hadn't seen visitors in many years, so they're excited. And they kept saying, well, how do we get more younger people, right? How do we get more younger families? And we started dreaming, and I said, okay. I said, let's, uh, let's imagine if God could do anything, and he can, what's some crazy things you'd ask for? And we wrote on the board. The first one I wrote was, that we would own the Baptist parsonage. And they laughed, they laughed so hard. And I said, hey, we gotta ask for it, right? The Bible says ask, we ask. I said, yeah, the, the parsonage is bigger than the church. So I said, we're gonna own that one day. And I said, we're gonna have a playground. And I said, we're gonna have a church that looks like our community. It was, it was half the community was Hispanic. We didn't have any Hispanic people. And I, I said, and they were like, well, that's good. And they were asking for a new parking center. And they were asking for all these kind of crazy things. So we made this crazy list, we called it. And we gave it to God. And then something happened. Something happened in that church. And two years later, I drove by that church again. Because they assigned me. I was a Methodist. They assigned you every year, right? Two years later, I go back to Springfield, Kentucky. I pull over and I start crying. 
I'm staring at the Baptist parsonage and it says Fellowship Hall, Springfield United Methodist Church. I look over there, there's a brand new playground. Everything on that list happened. So much so that that church had outgrown one service, had moved to two, and they had a Spanish-speaking pastor on staff. God did it all. He did. And I started thinking, well, what is that? And what's that got to do with us today? And, and I want to read you this verse. In Isaiah chapter uh, 43, verse 18, listen to this. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Very clear. God is saying what? Don't always be pondering the past and don't always be bringing up that junk in your past. Why? Well, if you've been teaching my daughter how to drive, I must have been teaching Blair, Blair Wade. Blair Wade and everybody. She's very outgoing. She's 15, and she has learned you have to use the mirrors. But Blair, are you supposed to use the mirrors more than the, the windshield or less? Less. Less. Why is that? So you can see what's in front so of you. So you can see what's in front of you, right. So what happens if you're always staring at those little mirrors, what does it say? Everything's distorted in the rearview mirror. Am I right? Nothing is as it really is. So if you're always looking in the rearview mirror of your life, what? Everything is distorted when you're always looking back. You don't have, your memory is not a clear picture of what current reality is. You have to be aware of your blind spots, but you have to be staring straight ahead. And that is called a hope in the future. When you have hope in the future, you're looking ahead. When you lose your hope in your future, you're always looking behind you. And when we always look behind us, we lose our vision for our life. We lose our hope and we perish. Without vision, people will perish. But it's really interesting. God tells us all the time in Scripture to be kids. And I always wonder, does that mean to be childish? Because we know kids aren't innocent, so we can strike that one, right? But what does that mean, God, that we're going to be kids and that what's that got to do with hope in the future? And then it reminded me of this. I was in Walmart last night and they had Christmas trees out. And I got excited. I said, Christmas is here. And my next thought was, wait a minute, what month is this? How did it turn October already? Raise your hand if you think time is going way too fast. Yes, have you noticed that? The older you get, the faster time goes. Kids, do you remember when you were kids, how long did it take Christmas to get here? It was a torture. You remember your grandma would always act like she loved you, and then she'd buy you that one present. I know your grandma. I'm not saying you've done this. But my grandma would give me this candy cane calendar where I could do the countdown on Christmas. I hated that thing. Because every day it's one candy cane. You're like, that day took a week. It's never going to get here. You, you think you make some momentum. And sure enough, you got 14 more days to Christmas. And it's just never slow than, you know, slower than Christmas. That's what we used to say. Why is it that when we're young, time is slow, but when we're older, time is fast? I have the answer to this. You know why? Because when you anticipate something, you set your eyes upon it. When you're looking at something, you're aware of it. In other words, you're, you're, you're in that moment. When you're looking forward to something, you're actually living in the moment. When you're looking forward to something, you're living so much in the moment, you're excited about the future. When you're excited about the future, time slows down. Because you're marking every single moment. When you don't have goals, or you know how it is, when you're 15, you want to be 16, so you're never 16. You know, when you're 16, you want to be 18, so you can be an adult. When you're 18, you want to be 21, I guess. But after 21, you want to turn 25 so you can have cheaper car insurance? I don't know. You kind of, it's after 21, you're like, okay, what now? So what happens is we go from people who are defined by what's happening next, anticipating the future, to where we don't have anything to look forward to. Well, when's Friday going to be here? Well, thank God it's Friday, you know, then all of a sudden it's Monday again. Let me get to the next Friday. So we dread our futures. We're, we're not excited. So what happens is we slip back and we start living in the past. We start letting our memories tell us about what reality is. We start defining ourselves by our failures, by our pain, by our hurts, by our constant broken promises. And it plays like a tape over and over and over in our head that we repeat the same behaviors over and over. We don't even think about the future. We don't want the future. We just want some kind of relief or some way to recapture where we were. Amen? But when the Bible tells us to be kids, kids dream, kids have imagination. Kids imagine what they want to be. 
doesn't have to make sense. They, they dream crazy things and, and they hope for it. And, and it gives them a future. You can't have a future without hope. You can't have hope without a future. Well, it makes us excited. And the Bible tells us very clearly that we have a choice. Do we want to be growing younger or growing older? But if you're in Christ, you're always growing younger. You know, do not ponder the things of the past. Don't go there. Don't live there. Don't keep going back to your past successes and whatever was great and whatever was bad. And because where is that going to get you? It's not going to get you anywhere. And you're going to miss time. You're going to miss life. And God has so much more to give you. Amen? The next verse says, Behold, I will do something new. Everybody say new. new. Whoa. Who's going to do it? He's going to do it. He says, if you stop pondering the past and you stop living in the past, then I can give you a new future. He does it. And new means you've never had it before. Is that true? Am I oversimplifying this? New means what? It means brand new. You've never had it. You never imagined it. You've never been there. You've never done that. You've never seen it. It's brand new. And all of a sudden, you start looking forward like, oh my goodness, what's he going to do? Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? What's going to happen in this church? What's going to happen in my life? What are the crazy dreams that I forgot about years ago that I want to resurrect and bring with me again? He says, I am doing something new. Now it will spring forth readily. What it means by that is God is saying, you don't have to go find a new view. It'll find you. Once you set your eyes upon Jesus, you forget your past, your future bound, you start dreaming again. What to spring forth means it just shows up right there where you are. To spring forth means, oh my goodness, here I am. To spring forth means God is bringing his blessings. They're showering over you. They're taking you over. And they are overwhelming you right now where you are. Now I need to say this. A lot of us, because of our past, believe a lie. And the lie is this. God doesn't love me anymore. That's a lie. I want to tell you that your God, your Father, loves you more than now. He loves you as much as he ever has, and he will never stop loving you. He still, he has not changed his mind for your life. He designed things in your life before the foundation of time, it says. And he didn't forget about it. Here's no plan B. There's only God's plan. And it's never too late. See, God loves you so much that he says, I have a hope and a future. I have not taken it back. I have not forgotten it. It's all based upon my goodness, my grace, my truth, not based upon your performance. So I want to say something. God loves you. He says it will spring forth. Will you, be, will you not be aware of it? In other words, the Bible is saying, are you looking for it? If you're so preoccupied with yourself and with past stuff, that you won't be able to see the new stuff that he's bringing all the time. You, you won't hear his voice. And you have to be in such a point where you're saying, like Paul did, whatever's behind me, I'm forgetting about it. I'm forgetting about it, and I'm straining forward for this upward calling. I'm straining forward for Jesus. I'm stripping off everything that's slowing me down. I'm repenting of every sin that's messing me up, that's coming from my past and my pain. I'm forgiving everybody that's ever hurt me, and I'm saying, God, I want it all gone that I may pursue you head on. For this glorious hope and this upward calling to live a life that's beyond my imagination. You know the Bible says that? The Bible says that he'll do more for you than you can even imagine. Better than you could ever hope for. God is bigger than your greatest hopes. But you have to believe that. And you have to believe that he's good. You have to believe that whatever is in your past is covered by the blood of Jesus. And it's forgiven to be remembered no more. You are not defined by your sin. You are defined by your relationship in Christ. Amen? When Emily has a dirty diaper, she does not cease to be my daughter. I may give her to Melissa, and I'm like, I don't smell it because I don't want to change it. But she's still my daughter. Well, a lot of us, we have like we have a dirty diaper in life. We think, does God doesn't want anything to do with me? I'm, God's mad at me, and, and he's ignoring me, and he's changed his mind, and he's got other plans, and moved on. That's not true at all. God loves you. We're the ones who leave him. He doesn't leave us. But something goes on from there. He says, I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. When you're in a wilderness, you can't get out. When you're in a wilderness, there's nothing familiar. 
When you're in a wilderness, you have nothing that will lead you out of that. You're stuck. You're just trying to survive. You're living uh, survival mode. Have you ever been through a crisis and you find yourself in survival mode? Yes? We've all been there, haven't we? If you're over the age of 20, you have gone through some hard times where you don't dream anymore. You go through a season where you're just trying to survive day to day. Amen? There are some folks watching this right now or in this room who are still in survival mode. And God's going to set you free of that today if you trust him. But God says, he says, I will come to you where you are. God loves you as you are, not as you ought to be. Because you're never going to be as you ought to be. God doesn't love you when you hitchhike your way out of the wilderness. God loves you in your wilderness. As you put your trust into him, let him handle your past and you look for the future. He's got that too. You know what happens? He builds a highway. He clears everything. He comes and rescues you. And when there's a highway, you know what that means? It means it's a clear path on where we're going now. It's a highway. I don't have to guess. Is this a trail? Is this a rabbit trail? It's clear. It's right in front of me. And he's raised up all the valleys. He's removed all the mountains. And I get to get out of here. But you got to believe that. He doesn't want you to stay in the wilderness. He'll come. He, he's with you. He says, I'll make rivers in the desert. He'll, he'll bring rivers. He'll bring nourishment to the driest places. It's not based upon the economy. It's not based upon anything else. It's based upon his desire to come get you. That's what he does. You don't got Jesus. Jesus got you. That's right. Amen? Amen. But you have to come to a place to say, Lord, I'm in a dry spot. I'm in the wilderness. And Lord, I keep remembering all this stuff. We have to decide, stop that cycle and start focusing on the promises of God. What does he say about me? I'm forgiven by the blood of Jesus. That, that sin is gone. Then why do I define myself by that? Amen? Amen. Get yourself out of time out and start walking. And I started thinking, what does this way look like? I think what it really looks like is, it looks like when we live that way, we become the people who are in form, but we're never transformed. We can look good on Sunday. We can try to look good on Sunday, but at home we're a totally different person. Our personal lives can be trash. And we try so hard to pull it together just enough. I don't even think we're trying to fool people. I think we're trying to fool ourselves sometimes. Well, maybe I'm not that bad. Or, or maybe, maybe, I, you know, I'm, maybe God will give me another chance. You know what I mean? I think deep down we're our worst enemies. You know, I think a lot of us worry about Satan, but uh, Satan's done it. We're doing a good, good enough job of beating ourselves up. I don't think he needs to step in half the time. Amen? So, so you, we're in a situation where we need transformation. I was reading this article about millennials. Now, Josiah, you guys are millennials. I apologize for us giving you that horrible label. I don't even know what it means exactly. But what that means is... Uh, what does that mean, millennials? You know what it means? It means millennials are leaving the church. Let me just get off this old soapbox right here. The millennials are leaving the church. What do we do? How do we get millennials back to church? That's very simple. We start preaching truth again. We take the show out of worship, and we start returning to Jesus. We start praying. We get church of action. We're out there building that highway with Jesus in the wilderness, and millennials will join. Because I know one thing about millennials, they want something real. Amen? But guess what? I'm a 45-year-old millennial then. Because I want the same thing. Right. You know, we need to quit making excuses and call it what it is. If we need to be a church of transformation. We're changed people. Yeah. We're not the same old person we were before. We don't talk like we did before. Yes, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm sure not where I was. Amen? I'm on a highway. I'm on a highway out of this place. You might pull over on a rest stop and take a little break, but get back on that highway. He's got great plans for you. I hope in the future. you got to believe it. When God led me to Isaiah 58, he says this. Listen to this. Now this, God's talking to a church that, that was no longer transformed. He's, he's, he's dealing with a group of people that were so caught up in their past that they didn't see where God was presently, but they were doing all the religious stuff, but there was no transformation, and they were complaining to God about it. And here's what God says. It starts off, he tells Jeremiah the prophet, Isaiah, 
He says, cry loudly and don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. And declare to my people their sin and to the house of Jacob their sins. And listen to this. Yet they seek me all day and they delight to know my ways, so they say. As a nation that has done righteousness and has not forsaken the ordinance of their God, they ask me for just decisions. They delight in the nearness of God. And they ask, well, God, why have we fasted and prayed and you don't see us? And they say, well, God, uh, we've humbled ourselves and, and you haven't noticed. So you got this situation where you got these people that seem to be doing it right. They're, they're obeying the law. They're, they're trying to seek God. And, and you would think, well, that's good, right? Well, what's wrong with that? That, that? We should be praying and fasting and asking God to help us with decisions. That's good, right? Is God mad about us asking for these things? Well, listen what happens. Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire, and you drive hard all your work. In other words, in the day of your praying with one thing, but in reality, you're doing whatever you want to do. You don't want to obey what I'm telling you. You want it your way like Burger King. You're a consumer. Just snap, and God will do whatever you want to do. You know, and you get all your desires, and, and, and they're still treating their family horribly. They're treating their workers horribly. There's no transformation. And that angers God, and it should. He says, Behold, you fast for contention and strife, and you strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast for you to uh, you do not fast like you do today to make your, your voice heard on high. And he talks about what difference is that making in your personal life? And and a lot of us can go through that. We can get into that little stuck in second gear thing, revving our engines or whatever, and there's been no change. I can go home and still be distant to my family. I can still post horrible things on Facebook. I can still be very judgmental toward other people. Whatever it is, there's a problem and we're acting religious with no change. And, and what? why is that? Well, if you get more into it, these were people that were caught up in their past. They were caught up in where they'd been. They always wanted to return to Egypt, whatever it was. They didn't believe in the change. They just wanted God to make them comfortable where they were. Now listen to this. Verse 6. God says, is this not the fast which I choose? And a fast is when you, when you not only pray, but you remove things from your life to be drawn closer to God. It's called repentance. So through fasting, you're aware of areas of your life that are not lining up to what God has asked you to do. So fa the purpose of fasting is to clean the house, if you will. Not just the guest room or the guest bathroom with a little seashell does anybody have the guest bathroom in your house with the fancy little soaps? Yes? You know what I'm talking about? Did you ever grow up in the houses that had the... Are you allowed to use those soaps if you're a guest or not? And they always have the guest towel that no one ever uses. Okay, I'm the only one who's seen a guest bathroom here. How about the living room? Did everybody have the living room from your grandparents that had the plastic on the couches? Yeah, you, you, you were there too. And the little candy dish with the candy in there is 150 years old, right? All right? If you try to eat that candy, it would take like four fillings out of your mouth. Okay, so you're there with me. See, that, God, that is not, that's what we do. We put the show, God wants everything. You see, God wants to deal with my past. God wants to deal with my wounds. God wants to deal with me, not just my behaviors. He wants to get to the root of why I do what I do. God loves me so much that he wants total transformation, and only he can do that as I let him in. And stop playing the little game. He says this. He says, this is the fast I choose. He says, this is what I want from you. Instead of being so reflective all the time and thinking so much about yourself and so much about your problems and so much about whatever, I want you to actually do something. Everybody say, do something. Do something. He says, loosen the bonds of wickedness. Say, do something. Do something. Undo the bands of the yoke. Everybody say, do something. Do something. And to let the oppressed go free. And then one more time, everybody say, do something. do something. And break every yoke. There's a big difference right there. You are on the prowl for what's not right in your community. If you see injustice, you're there. If you see somebody suffering, you're there. If you see something like last night, most of I were eating wings, and these customers were being very rude to the waitress, I, I had to get Melissa not to stand up and get in a fight. She was defending that poor girl's honor. She pulled her aside. She says, I got your back. What do you need? And I told Melissa, I said, we well, just need to tell the manager, but you're doing it, right? 
I don't want to go to jail. I'm not supposed to preach on the next morning. But, but Melissa was on the prowl. You see, Melissa saw something wasn't right and made her mad. Do we as a church get mad at injustice in our city? Do we get mad at people who are, that people are just dying of drug overdoses all around us? Do we, does that burden us? Does it crush our spirits when we see people with unemployment or we see people not being treated equally? Does that make us mad? We'll say, well, God bless them. I said, we'll say in Georgia, we'll say, well, God bless them. I'm not going to do anything, but uh, well, God bless them. Well, you know, your son joined the military. He's doing something. He's spending his whole life doing something he believes in. And he says this. He says, it's just not, he says, divide your bread with the hungry. Whose bread? I should, should I just tell you to divide your bread? No, I divide my bread. To divide means to take from what I have and give to somebody else. And how many of you know that when you live with, a, with, a, with an attitude of dividing, God will always multiply? Amen. Amen? But we always tend to, to lose what we hoard and hang on to. Am I right about that? Yes. We, we lose the very thing that we hang on to so much. He says, you give them some bread. And you bring the homeless poor into the house. And when you see someone who is naked, you cover them. And do not hide yourself from your own family. It got really quiet. Facebook, I got really quiet. It's so hard to remember that. As we see need, we give. What is the difference? Because I'm not looking at myself anymore. I'm not looking at what I have or don't have, my experiences, my bad experiences, my good experiences. I'm not looking at my qualifications. I am so non-self-consumed that I can consume with Christ. And if I'm consumed with Christ, I now am consumed with you. You see, to be humble doesn't mean to have a low opinion of yourself. Some people say, well, I'm just a poor old little Christian. God barely loves me. I'm a sinner saved by grace. God help me. That's called pride. That's the worst kind of pride. Pride is when you think too much of yourself. You can think too much of yourself on a high level. You can think too much of yourself on a low level. The pride is just thinking too much about myself. Humility is selfless. How you doing, Josh? I haven't thought about that. Uh, I've been busy over here helping with this cause, and well, that's a weird question to ask me. How am I doing? I don't know. You see what I'm talking about? And, and these are the people that change the world. And he says this. He says, when you do this, then your light will break out like the dawn. And, and listen to this. Your recovery will speedily spring forth. Your recovery. You're healed as you're in the process of healing others. God is blessing you and taking care of you as you are feeding other people. Need I remind you of the story of the five loaves and the two fish. The disciples had nothing to give them, and these people were really hungry. So God took what they had, he received it, he blessed it, and when they were done, they took up 12 baskets of leftovers for the 12 disciples. You hear what I'm saying? As we give what we have to others, as we serve in the name of Jesus, God will always multiply and take care of us as well. Amen? Amen. But so many times I think we've gotten this idea to take care of yourself first. Nope. Nope. The problem is self. He says, your righteousness will go for you. What's that mean? You'll have a reputation. Reputations always precede you. It's what people think, and, and people get the reputations of you based on what they observe in you, what you say, how much you love. And it's the people that love others the most are the ones that people want to be near. Amen? It's the givers. That's why we like grandma so much. You guys just give, give, give. I bet if they were to ask you what you want for Christmas, what would you say? Just be together with you guys. I want you to have your needs met. And you believe it, right? You hear that? That's freedom. To be able to give. Boy, when you got nothing to lose, you got everything to give. Am I right about that? Wow. And your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Whoa, wait a minute. You know what? For those of you who are stuck in your past, I want you to say, God will meet you there. God will, well, I, I was saying that. Y'all repeated that. That was good. That's really good. I didn't ask you to. I'm sorry. If you're stuck in your past, God loves you so much, he'll meet you there. His glory will meet you there. 
If you're so busy looking this way, he'll come around this way and say, get your attention, says, look at me. Take me by the hand and walk me to where you want me to be. That's how you get on track. If you're stuck in the past, the glory that God will be your rear guard. That's so good. Then, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, if you stop with the pointing of the finger and the speaking of evil of wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom will become like midday. Your gloom, your depression is gone as you love others. Your gloom becomes like the midday. At the midday, there's no shadows. In the midday, the sun is straight up in the, in the air. There's no shadows. It means that everything in your life will be clear. There'll be no areas of gray. You'll see clearly what's going on before you. Amen? And when you can see clearly what's going on before you, guess what? You're not afraid now. You're not afraid to walk in faith. You're not afraid to take that risk. You're not afraid of the what ifs anymore. You just simply have enough light to make that next step. The one on that highway that's leading you out of the wilderness. I love this. And the Lord will continually guide you. Who? You. You, you and me. He'll continually guide and satisfy your desire in sports places. And give, you, give strength to your bones. And you will be like a well-watered garden. Like a spring of water whose waters do not fall. You will be so blessed and you will be so provided for that people will look at you and say, wait a minute, the conditions of this world don't, aren't conducive to the blessings I see going on in you right now. I grew up in Georgia. We had a lot of droughts every summer. And when we went on a drought, we'd have a watering ban. And you had, you couldn't water, or it was an even odd number of days, whatever it was. And I remember we had this one neighbor near my grandma's house. He always had a beautiful, beautiful lawn. Everybody got suspicious. Wait, we're in a drought. There's no rain. All of our lawns are dead. But yet, yours is perfectly manicured, and you're, you're not allowed to water. What's going on? You know what it was? They ran a hose from the creek behind their house, and they had to put a sign in their yard saying, being watered from creek supply. You see, that's how our lives are to look. People look at your lives, and they say, I don't understand it. There's no way, considering the circumstances, the conditions, and the economy, and all this stuff going on, there's no way you're being blessed. I don't get it. And you can say, I'm being watered from a source. You can't see that it's sprung up from underneath of me, and it's taking care of me because my God has met me where I am, and he's leading me out. Amen? Amen. And then you turn around and you give it away. He says, listen, I want to end with verse 12 right here. It says, for those from among you... <coughs> They will rebuild the ancient ruins. I believe that's our millennium. God's going to use you to rebuild this church. God's going to use you to build something beautiful that we've never seen. We get to watch you guys. Yeah, we're a part of it too, but I believe all my heart is the millennials. It's the next generation. It's you, player. It's our kids. It's us now. It's all kids of God. But God's going to build something we have never seen. Better than we could ever hope for. You will raise up the old, the age-old foundations, and you will be called repair of the breach, the restore of the streets in which to dwell. Why would somebody go from being so self-absorbed or out of pity party despair or consumed with their own need? How would somebody make that transition from from not pointing the finger anymore and loving your neighbor. What, what, what happened? There has to be some kind of change. Did they just get determined one day? What happened? You want to know? Should I read the final verse? I will. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 starts with verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. The important thing is we walk now. Because if you're not walking in faith, you're not walking. 
You might be moonwalking backward, but you're not walking forward. Guarantee you this, you're living in fear and you're paralyzed by it and you're afraid to do anything. Or you're so caught up with your own self and your past. Uh -oh. Battery, who cares? Keep going. A little closer to the mic here. You run out of batteries yourself. Because you've been trusting your own supply, you've been trusting your own energy, your own works. But I want to tell you that if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you and you have totally surrendered to God, He will continually feed you. He will continually to flow through your life and to give you power and strength that you would have never tapped into yourself. That's what walking by faith is. To walk by faith is to say, I refuse to take, to, to take things as they seem to be. I will walk as things are, God's preferred future. That future, that hope, his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as in heaven. I believe that. I perceive it. I'm walking in it. And I'm not going to stop until we all see it. But I'm not going to leave it on your shoulders. I'm going to do my part. Amen? Amen. Now close with this. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have gone away new has come. It does not say you are new and improved. You're new. The old stuff is what? Gone. Okay. What about my divorce? What about this or that? Where is it? Gone. Gone. Has God remembered it anymore? No. Okay, well what about um, all these sins I've been confessing to him that y'all don't know about? Guess where they are? Gone. They're gone. It's like they never happened to be justified if you're in Christ and you have asked him to forgive you of all your sins. You have put all your faith and trust in him and you're living by grace and you have repented. Why wouldn't you repent? You know what it means? It means if I'm in the wilderness, I don't like where I am and Jesus is coming to me on a highway, I go, okay. Forget about where I've been. Forget about these habits I've tried to break. Whatever it is, Lord Jesus, I'm going to go with you right now. I'm repenting. I'm leaving this wilderness. I'm going to follow you. You're going to guide me out of this. It's a total change of heart. It's a change of mind. It's a change of will. Everything in my life that's still clinging to me, I'm going to cast it off in the name of Jesus. If there's anything in my life that's drawing me away from God, I want it gone because I don't want anything to hold me back from this hope and this future that he has for me. And every time I fall back in the same old sins or live in a life that's not repentful, I'm reminding myself of the old pain and the old hurts that led me to the current state that I'm in. But when I say, God, the past is the past. You've met me there. You've forgiven me. You've healed that wound that happened to me or whatever it was. Then you're able to say, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. And he's going to lead you somewhere you've never been. Amen? Amen. Amen.